Hello, this is Nathan. I'm going to start under construction in just a couple minutes. If you happen to be watching, um, please uh, let me know. Uh, you know, put a message in the chat. Let me know who you are, and so that if you have questions later, I know to look out for them. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes just to let people show up, and then I will get things started. Hello, good afternoon to, well, people coming in from America. Good evening to anyone who's viewing from Europe. Um, happy Mother's Day to those of you who observe it. Um, I'm Nathan Curtis, and this is Under Construction, where I uh, will be showing you how to construct various puzzles on the fly. Today, we are uh, starting off with uh, our first episode. The puzzle that I am going to be doing is... Let me just. The Snake Charmer. Um, I'm going to spend the first 10 minutes or so going over what a Snake Charmer is and um, the basics of how we're going to go about constructing one. Um, and then I will go over to my workspace where I will go about constructing one. So, to get started, I want to say. To just introduce myself since this is the first episode. My name is Nathan Curtis and I am a puzzle constructor. I write a, a lot of different puzzle types, uh, variety cr crosswords, cryptic crosswords, a few logic puzzles, puzzle hunts. I, I do a little bit of everything at least as far as pencil and paper puzzles is concerned. I'm not so uh, experienced with physical puzzles or uh, um, digital puzzles or escape rooms but I'm trying to branch out. Um, you can find a lot of my work at Tortoise Shell Studio, which is on Patreon. I'm also the editor-in-chief of a magazine called Hatched, which uh, focuses on puzzles by newer constructors. Uh, I have a puzzle hunt called What's That Spell, which went out uh, two years ago and can be purchased from my website. And currently I am working on a puzzle hunt called Verwald's Treasures, which was uh, funded on Kickstarter earlier this, this year and is going to be going out live in Boston in... Uh, this summer and out electronically to people at home in uh, the fall. So under construction is going to be a puzzle construction live stream. Every episode I'll choose a new puzzle type, give you an overview of how that type works, and walk through the construction process. I will explain some of my decisions as I go along. Um, I will, uh, you can ask questions in chat and if I'm observant enough I will answer them. Uh, and I'm going to try to keep these to about two hours, which means that sometimes I may do a smaller version of a puzzle that would ordinarily take me longer than two hours to construct. And sometimes I may skip some of the steps that are, I think, less informative to the process. So we're starting with Snake Charmer. This is a variety crossword type, which to my knowledge was... Uh, created by Patrick Berry. You can see a lot of examples on his website at A-Frame Games. The grid is usually a single loop, um, often in the shape of an S, but not always. Some of the squares have numbers. They go from one to eh, however many you need. E the answer to each clue begins in one of the numbered squares and goes around the, cl 
goes around the loop, usually clockwise, but there's no particular reason that it has to be clockwise. The chain of entries will go around the loop twice. Every letter will be used in two entries. This is a uh, common theme in most variety crosswords. Uh, and one key thing is that there, you will have different entries the second time you go around the loop. And um, in order to make sure that happens, no two entries will begin or end in the same square. So here's an example of a snake of an empty snake charmer grid of a puzzle that I wrote, I don't know, a couple years ago. Um, you see that we have um, number one starting in the upper right hand right of the screen. And as we go around two, three, going clockwise, um, if you skip over the numbers that don't come consecutively, you come around 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, and then we come around and do uh, keep on going after 13 uh, in between some of the numbers that we've already done. This may be a little bit easier to understand if you look at the finished puzzle. So first, here is the puzzle with all of the answers filled in. Um, it may be hard to tell what answer goes, uh, what the division between the answers is in this case with the numbers removed, but let's take a closer look at the upper right hand corner with some of the answers highlighted. The first time around the loop, we have uh, number one, the answer to whatever clue that was, was respect. Number two was oral. Number three was final exam. Um, and then we continue on with more answers uh, and continue around the grid. When we come around to, I guess it was entry number 13 probably, um, we have a different set of answers. 13 is Torres, which overlaps with the RES of respect. The second half of respect is taken up by the beginning of pectoral fin, which has all of oral in it, and the beginning of final exam. And then we have Alex, which is entirely contained within final exam. And it continues in this manner. So even though the letters are the same, because the boundaries of the words are different, we have a different set of words. Um, those are the basic defining qualities of a snake charmer, but we also have some additional uh, conventions that we want to follow. So the grid size and shape. You could theoretically have a grid that is any number of, any number of squares in it. Um, in practice, we, we generally use the S size grid. Um, the one that Patrick Berry uses is seems to always be 86 letters. And it's generally the case for many of these that once you've drawn a grid, it's a pain to draw another one of a different size. Um, I wound up drawing my own grid in, in uh, illustration software, and occasionally I will do something with say 92 or 98 squares it's easier to add six squares at a time given my template. Um, Patrick Berry has a variant called circuit breakers, which instead of an um, instead of a snake-shaped grid, it's entirely uh, straight lines and right angles, and is sort of a jagged box shape. And um, that one can be it needs to be an even number of letters if you work out the the um, the math behind it, but you could really have any even number of letters, uh, so you could have almost any size you want. Occasionally, I will do custom grids. I did. I once did a puzzle that was a snake charmer variant that I called Sigil of Pain for my first puzzle hunt, uh, What's That Spell? Uh, one of my test solvers said, you know, I think you were asking for trouble when you called this puzzle Sigil of Pain, and all the trouble that you had with this grid you brought on yourself, and that's probably true. Um, it took a long time to draw the grid, and then there were all these problems with making sure that the, the, the grid crossed itself in various places, went over and under itself, and I had to make sure that those happened in the right places, and it was a lot of work. I don't recommend it. Uh, we're also going to talk about what, what constitutes an entry in this puzzle. Um, many of you may be used to crossword puzzles in which um, these days, you can have a lot of different things as, as entries in crossword puzzles, ranging from ordinary, uh, common, uncapitalized words, to proper names, to titles, to multi-word phrases, to abbreviations. Um, our scope is usually uh, similar to that, but not quite as extensive. 
um, I try to use English words, proper names, titles, common phrases, occasionally common foreign words and phrases. Um, things that would appear in crosswords that I would rather avoid are abbreviations, multiple word partials, that is uh, two or more words from a larger phrase that don't really stand on their own. Sometimes you can take a, a single word from a larger from a larger phrase that you would never that you would rarely see on its own. For example, topsy from topsy turvy, um, I have seen in a snake charmer, but I would not want say skip to for skip to my loo. Roman numerals uh, abbreviations. I will say one thing about uh, some abbreviations. I'm fine with using um, if they are uh, if they're sufficiently long. If they're very common perhaps more common than the unabbreviated form of the word. Um, if they're frequently pronounced rather than read out, those are the sort of things that I would um, be more inclined to use. For example, NASA, you almost never see National Aeronautics and Space Administration in its place. Uh, even though they're not pronounced, things like NCAA, NAACP, other abbreviations that might not start with N. But um, one thing about these uh, things like abbreviations, multi-word partials, Roman numerals. In a lot of variety crosswords, the emphasis is really on finding interesting wordplay. Um, in, in a snake charmer, you're looking to find overlaps between words. And it's kind of less interesting if you have an overlap between some initialism that is, you know, could be fairly arbitrary. Uh, the minimum length for an entry in a snake charmer is generally, like, as in crosswords, three letters. However, I like to make sure that whenever two, let, two entries overlap, they should have at least two letters in common. And what this means, if you look at, if you look at the case where um, a word is divided, overlaps between two or more words, it's got to have at least two letters in common with the word at its beginning, and at least two letters in common with the word at its end, that means that it's going to be four letters long, at least. The one exception is if a word is entirely contained within another entry, then it could be three letters. But most entries are going to be at least four letters. So the strategy that I'm going to follow for constructing a, um, a snake charmer is has a few different steps. In many, uh, in snake charmer, as in most uh, variety crosswords, I like to start with a seed entry. Um, a seed entry is going to be something that is particularly interesting uh, in my mind. Uh, it's harder as you go along to get longer words into the puzzle, so it's good to start off with a longer seed if you can. So I like to find, uh, there are a couple possibilities. You can find two entries that have a long overlap. You can have one entry, long entry that it contains one or more shorter entries in entirely within it. And in either case, you should make sure that the leftovers that don't overlap on either side of, of those words can make plausible word beginnings and endings, because we're going to be continuing those endings as we go along. So uh, just as, as an example, um, a good example would be uh, from the puzzle that I just showed you a few minutes ago, American Dream and Andrea Mitchell. They overlap in the letters A-N-D-R-E-A-M, which is shared by both of them. And then if you look at the parts that don't overlap, in American Dream, we have A-M-E-R-I-C. That's not a good word ending on its own, but we have Eric, which is a very plausible um, entry as someone's name. And then something ending in A-M. I can think of lots of words that end in A-M. Over with Andrea Mitchell, we have itch. Again, a good word contained on its own. And ELL, which, can, which is not as common a beginning as, as it would be an ending, but it still begins some things like Ellington, Ellis, Ellis Island. So um, it's a pretty good start. An example that has a nice overlap but doesn't work out would be Esplanade and Lana Del Rey. They have L-A-N-A-D-E in common, um, and, um, but the Esplanade would have you ending an entry with ESP. ESP is a fine standalone entry in some puzzles, but they're not a lot of, there, I can't think of any words that end in ESP. 
and even worse is Lana Del Rey, which will have entries beginning with L-R-E-Y. Um, uh, Andrew Eston points out that in American Dream, you could also have Eric Andre hidden in there, um, a comedian. And I actually considered that, but one reason that I didn't do that was because it sort of um, it sort of passes the buck in a way. Because as you're constructing, if if I had you if I had had this in the middle of a puzzle, I might have had something where I had AM left over, and I said, okay, what can I do to extend AM? If I come up with American Dream and then I put Eric Andre inside of it, what I'm left with at the other side is AM. So I have to start another word with AM, and I've sort of uh, just created the same problem for myself. Sometimes this is okay, but I, I like to avoid that if possible. Um, another example of this sort of thing is if you have uh, the letters IC and you go, oh, Icelandic. That has Eland inside it, the uh, antelope. And then you look at the other end and you say, oh, I have IC left over. I guess I have to solve the problem again with a different word. So now we're going to, um, once we've found a seed, we're going to find new entries to continue these leftovers. Um, you can work in either direction. Usually it's easier to work forward because we uh, tend to have an easier time coming up with, with words that start with a given set of letters than with end in a given set of letters. Um, I like to look for opportunities to have one entry contain, contain another, um, as opposed to just having um, straight overlaps between successive words. Once you're close to the desired size, you want to try to finish the loop. Um, that is, trying to find uh, some letters that will... Uh, wind up using the leftovers in both directions on either side um, and I usually like to give myself at least uh, at least eight letters um, of leeway before um, in order to th think about the ending that is if I'm um, writing an 86 letter grid I want to start worrying about closing it at around 78 letters and when you fi finish the loop sometimes it's the case that you will that you will find that if you trace your entries around the loop, you will actually have two separate loops. This is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a fine puzzle on its own. It's just not the um, standard of a of a snake charmer. So you want to fix that if necessary. And we'll talk about how to fix that as we go into as we go through the construction process. Um, there are once you've done the grid, there are a few things that you should do to finish it. These are going to be optional, and I may not actually get to them in during this live stream. Uh, make sure you have a blank grid of the correct size. Um, I started off by um, taking, looking at one of Patrick Berry's snake charmers, and I actually uh, um, stole his grid. I took a screenshot of one of the puzzles, and I imported it into a graphics program and used that. And I felt guilty about that. And then I realized eventually that, I A, it wasn't the best resolution because I was taking a screenshot, B, I couldn't modify it easily if I wanted to make my own variations on it. And C, I was, I, um, was learning how to do graphics, um, to a, at least graphics for grids, to a degree. And so I, start, I wound up making my own grid in uh, the vector graphics program Inkscape. Um, I have a 86 square template and a couple of templates of other sizes in case I uh, decide to do a different size. Um, I prefer to use a vector format. Uh, you know, both for reasons of resolution and it's easier to modify than a uh, bitmap. If you're doing an entirely square grid, sometimes I will make the grid as a table in something like Microsoft Word. This is usually more common for things like uh, that are actually on a square grid and uh, fully two-dimensional like marching bands or a standard crossword. Add numbers to the blank grid and when you're doing that, count carefully. And I'm actually going to say, no, don't add, add the numbers to the blank grid. Um, first, put the letters in, then add the numbers. That will help you to count better. Um, this was something that I, that I didn't think to do until later in my writing, uh, in my experience with writing these. Write some clues, lay out your clues and the, and the blank grid, lay out your solution file, test and edit, always test and edit. And when you're done, you can publish or submit your puzzle. And we'll talk about that um, towards the end of the stream. Okay, so now that that is done, I'm going to bring up my workspace. Now normally, 
Normally, I do my most of my variety crosswords on graph paper. And I take little notes by hand to indicate what I am doing. Um, for instance, in a snake charmer, I will just write all the letters out in several rows and put uh, heavy lines between the word boundaries. And then I go and count the letters to see where I am. And then I have to go through and figure out if I have one loop or two. And it's there's a lot of freedom that graph paper gives you, but it's not so great for live streaming. Uh, you probably wouldn't be able to see it very well. So here is a uh, Google Sheets worksheet that I have set up. I've done a couple of things in particular. Um, I have. You'll see that um, I have uh, these unformatted rows in white and a first time and second time in gray. And I've set the first time and second time to automatically copy whatever is in the unformatted row. So if I have, and I'm going to put one letter per square in the unformatted row. So if I put example, the letter's example will uh, then go down into the two rows and be automatically copied. What I'm going to do to distinguish uh, what makes a word in each time around is I will go through and um, shade the highlight the background in various different colors. So I might use orange for one time around and then for another time around use blue and purple. And as I go along I will keep shading in words to indicate the, the word boundaries. Um, I also have up here a letter count which counts all of the letters in the unformatted rows only. I also have some conditional formatting attached to that cell that, that when I get to, in this case, 78 letters, this letter count will be highlighted in orange to let me know that I'm getting close to the end and I should worry about tying things together. Now, I said that we need to start with a seed. Uh, this can often be a... Uh, finding a seed is often just a case of looking around and seeing what words strike your fancy. Um, if you notice you know, a word in a sign or in a in an, uh, an advertisement or, or the news, and you say, oh, I can do something with that word. That's often the seed for a puzzle. Um, it's hard to do that on the spot. So a couple days ago, I thought of what could I use for a seed for this live stream. And after some thinking about names in the news, I decided to, uh, um, I hit upon the singer Rihanna and noticed that Oops, not that many ends. Noticed that the end of her name, the H Hana, could be turned into Hanna Barbera. And if we do that, the first time through we have Rihanna. Uh, do that in orange. The second time through we have Hanna Barbera. We see that in the leftovers we have barb here which i'm going to highlight in yellow with an era hanging over and an ri over here now the ri is kind of tricky but i'll get to that in a second you might say well why don't we put in barber instead of barb because barber is a little bit longer and it's usually more interesting to have longer words barber would leave just a single letter overlapping the the a I prefer to have more than at least two letters overlapping in each case, as I said in the uh, various constraints and uh, parameters and conventions. And that's because if you're working along and you only have one letter overlap, that's not really as helpful, especially in the case where you have, say, an S and you know that the an, an, an answer ending in S and you know that it's a plural noun. Well, I already knew that it ended in S. Thank you very much. So at least two letters to overlap uh, to make the puzzle more helpful to solvers. So now we go back, I'm going to go back to the RI in uh, Rihanna. I was, I was thinking there aren't many entries that, that 
end in ri but one did jump to mind immediately potpourri so i'm gonna put that in here and the nice thing about potpourri is that we have yet again another hidden word poor and that poor can be used in as an entry on its own and then we have something that ends in pot now I want to be careful here with having an entry ending in pot because the po in potpourri literally means pot you don't always have to have the words be completely etymologically distinct but I like to at least have them uh, not be too similar and so you think well what can I do with pot well, if we turn pot into spot, then uh, we might have something that is distinct from potpourri sufficiently. I'm going to actually back up and do this on the third line. I'm sort of putting in arbitrary line breaks where I need to and letting the letter count guide itself. So um, I'm going to go to one of my favorite references now and see what sort of things end in spot. My two uh, most frequent references when writing uh, puzzles like this are the dictionary search engine cot and Nutramatic. Uh, they have different purposes and different uh, design setups. The nice thing about cot is that it has a built-in so-called equation solver where you can um, solve for se sequences of letters that make words in make multiple words in different ways simultaneously. The nice thing about Nutramatic is that instead of having one set dictionary, it mines all of Wikipedia and will allow you to search for arbitrary phrases ranked by statistical likelihood. I'm going to start with Cot in this case. Cot ha both Cot and Nutramatic have their own idiosyncratic syntaxes, which um, can be a turnoff to beginning users, but um, once you've mastered the syntax, you can do a lot of powerful things with both of them. So um, basic uh, dictionary searches with cot are generally pretty simple. If I want to find all the words that end in, end in spot, I would go um, star spot, uh, lowercase letters. But uh, just to illustrate what I was talking about with um, the problem of pot. If I just look for star pot, it gives me pot, spot, uh, depot. This is a large dictionary, so some things are not words that I would normally use, but um, as you go through these, a lot of them are words that use pot to mean a container and in the same sense as potpourri. And those that don't generally either use spot or are words that I would not really want to use myself, or there's depot, but that's only a two letter uh, overlap. It's just a five letter word. I, I would like to go for more, uh, a little more ambitious than that. So I'll start with, with spot. And the nice thing about spot is it gives us an end, the word previous to it will end in S, which is a pretty common word ending. So looking over these, um, desk spot, eye spot, hot spot, um, it's a little bit uh, medical, but I happen to like liver spot because it will give us, um, the livers will give us a nice ending for another one. So I'm going to put this at the bottom of the third row because otherwise it would um, break in the middle of one of the sequences of letters. So, liver spot. And liver spot is going to be in. Oh, right. So, pot is in orange. And once we've gone over this break, we're now going. Uh, to put it in the second time around. And now we have something that ends in livers. Uh, and 
even though I didn't like a two-letter entry, I, uh, I avoided the two-letter overlap with pot because depot is a pretty short word to be overlapping two words. But delivers is a bit longer, so I will stick with the DE here. And I'm going to stop working backwards now because DE is a very common ending and there's a lot that I could do with it. So, uh, oh, I keep on making it too light. So rather than work on that, I'm going to work from the forward end now. We have ERA. Uh, there's not a whole lot that begins with ERA, but there's some. There's erase, eraser, erasing, erasure, uh, eradicate, Erasmus. Uh, but some of those are not really suitable. For instance, eradicate, if we put that in, we'd have something that begins with D-I-C-A-T-E, not a very good word beginning. Similar with uh, Erasmus. So I'm going to take some form of erase. I like erasure and erasing because they're both uh, common four-letter strings. Uh, but between the two, I think I prefer erasing. If I had erasure, I'd have something starting with sure as the next word. And that there are there are lots of phrases that begin with sure, but they sort of break at that sure. So I could do sure fire, sure thing, um, probably some other sure phrases. And but if I do any of those, the next word is going to start with the second half of that phrase. If I had sure fire. Then after erasure, I would have something starting with fire. And so again, we have two uh, entries that have a lot of uh, meaning in common, which I want to avoid. So rather than do erasure, I'm going to do erasing. And there are more options for, wor for words and phrases that start with sing that don't break up at the same place. You can have singer, single, Singleton, singlet. Um, singleton is nice because it's kind of long, but then you have let on at the beginning, and that's a phrase in itself, and they end at the same place. So I'm just going to go with, uh, in this case, with singlet. So once again, highlighting the words to indicate where the breaks are. So uh, now we have let, another good word beginning, and we could go with phrases like let it be, let it go, let it ride, let it bleed, uh, things with let's, let's go, let's... Um, uh, I'm going to go back to... This time I'm going to go to Nutramatic, because there's so many options. Um, I'm going... To Neutromatic has a sy syntax which is similar to regular expressions. Um, I am going to search for let in lowercase, capital A, which means any alphabetic character, an asterisk, which in this case means any any number of repetitions of the previous expression. So let followed by any number of alphabetic characters. Go. And um, these are ranked by statistical likelihood. And they're also not only ranked in terms of order, but by the size of the font. So the ones in large font are pretty darn likely. As you get into less likely words, they will shrink until they're barely visible. So we have letter, letters, let's, uh, and because it is just doing uh, combinations of words, it will sometimes have partial phrases like letter to, let the, letter of, these would not be good entries on their own. There are multi-word partials at best. But uh, so you need to sift through these and see what, what you like. Lethal's pretty, uh, has a nice look to it because it's Hal. Um, letters to, well, letters to Cleo, but that doesn't leave a good beginning at the overlap. Letting could be Ting, but we already have an Ing, so I don't want to do too many of those in a row. Uh, letters in, let him, oh, Letterman. Letterman, ah, oh. Letterman has, as in David Letterman, has a nice term in it. So we have another overlap of a four-letter word. So I'm going to go back, and I'm going to put in 
Ah, mm. uh, nope. T E R M. So we have term down here. Mm -hmm. And then an A N up here for Letterman. Um, a N is another good word beginning. Unfortunately, it's a word beginning that I've used that I've used in many other snake charmers. So I often have things that I've already used for an that I don't want to that I don't like reusing. I don't mind reusing a single word, but I do prefer to have different. If I am reusing a single word, I want to use it in different ways, in in breaking it up in different ways. So some examples of things that I've already done with an are Andromeda. And dromedary, um, and yeah, keeps going to the wrong side. Antithesis and tithe or tithes. Um, but I like I like the idea of using an as part of anti or anti a n t i a n t e. So I'm gonna do another um, search. Um, and then I'm going to show you how to use the so-called equation solver for cot. So if I have something here that begins a n t i or e and continues, you know, I might have a four, a four letter word or longer here that is contained in both of them, um, and then have um, that is a four-letter word starting with T-I or T-E, and then some more letters that continue the anti or anti word. And the way I'm going to do that is um, variables. Uh, so cot takes variables, which are uppercase letters, and they stand for um, just arbitrary strings of letters that can have various properties. So I'm going to say A equals T, oh, lowercase t, um, use lowercase letters for literal letters. IE means either I or E. Dot dot makes it at least, uh, dot is the symbol for a single arbitrary letter. So this is at least four letters. Star means zero or more other letters. So anything that begins with TI or E and is at least four letters. Um, this means that A, because I have uh, of Cot's particular syntax, this is specifying that this string, T, I, or E, two unknown letters and some other number of unknown letters, is itself a word. A, and then the other string that I want is the one that begins with A, N, uses the same letters as um, the T, I, E, so I'm going to say A again. Uh, I want it to extend at least two letters beyond that so that the next word has some overlap. So this will return all of the possibilities where both um, A, capital A by itself of this, fo of this form is a word, and when that same string is put into this format, putting AN before it and adding at least two letters after it is also a word. Search. The simultaneous uh, equations take longer for cot to, to uh, search through than a single dictionary search, but it's usually pretty fast unless you have like five or six different simultaneous equations that you're trying to solve. All right, so we have, let me see, it, it will give me up to 1,000. It says it gave me 90. I'm just going to go backwards because it tends to sort them by length, so I'll go with the longest ones first. Um, and you see that some of them have words that, while they're in the dictionary that, that Cot uses, are not necessarily words that you would want to use in a puzzle, like tig. Um, I don't know if that's short for tiger or something else. And besides, even with that, the antigenic determinant, the leftover letters, would not make a word. So I'm just going to go through here. Tide and antidepressants is kind of nice, but the press is sort of the same thing. Um, I, but I might... I might uh, use that some other time. 
Um, so I, I've already mentioned using something like antithesis, in this case, antithetically. Uh, antipsychotic is another interesting one, but the beginning cotic would, it could work if I use Cho as in Margaret Cho and then have tick. Um, let's see, antithetical, antitheistic. Um, ooh. Um, antichambers is nice, but I, what I, I what I like even better is than antichambers here is if I go and look for the singular antichamber. Tech is a fine word, and then amber is a word on itself, but it can also be a part of a longer word or phrase like amber alert, which would then have us starting with alert or. Um, I just thought of the word ambergris, so I'm going to put in antechamber and ambergris. Again, oh whoops, I did not mean, I accidentally uh, highlighted in the wrong row, so I will uh, do highlight that. Amber grease being a waxy substance produced by whales, I think, used in perfumes and other uh, other ap applications. Um, I swear I'm not making it up. Antichamber would be in purple. So now we have gris, which is um, not entirely common, but has some things. Um, you could have, let's see. This time I'm going to just go off the top of my head. You could have gristle, but T-L-E is not a good beginning. Grizzly is fine, but L-Y, some things begin with L-Y, but not a lot. And I've used L-Y a lot because it's a common ending for adverbs and some adjectives. Uh, let's see, Gus Grissom would give us S-O-M. Uh, John Grisham gives us H-A-M. I like Grisham better than Grissom, I think. He's a little bit more familiar to a modern audience. Um, and Ham's a nice... Uh, Ham's a nice beginning. All right. Now we have Ham. Let, let me check the letter count. We're at 58 letters, so we have about uh, another 28 letters or so to go. Ham. There's... Um, I'm going to go back to Neutromatic and see what we have for, in this case, Ham, capital A star. Give me things starting with Ham. Hamilton, of course, but Ilton is not a good beginning. Same with Hampshire. Hamburg, Hamlet. Hamlet is a nice word, but we've already used let, and I don't like using that twice in a, in a puzzle. Hammer could be possible. Uh, Hammond. Hamper, Hammersmith is not too good. Uh, Hampton, Hamburger, Hamlin, Hammerthrow, Hamstring. Unfortunately, that we'd be reusing string, and I think it's sort of the same thing. But uh, Hammerstein, Hamburg, Germany. Hamel, hamster, hamster. I like hamsters. Um, hammock. Um, ha hammock might be interesting because we'd have something like mock turtle soup, but you have to make sure that whatever the comes after mock can be turned into a different word. Uh, Hamilton, hamburgers, hammerhead. I'm probably going to go with hamster or what was the other one that I mentioned? Uh, not hamstring. Hammock. That's right. So let me just compare those, see what we have with mock. Mocked, mocking, mockingbird, mockery, mockumentary, mock trial. Mock up, 
Yeah, like I, as I was thinking, there's not much that is particular that would allow me to go in a different direction. Moth heroic. But if we try stir for hamster, sterling is a possibility. Stereo is not good because EO is a bad beginning. Sterile, uh, stern, stereotype, sternum. Uh, Stereo lab, sternum. So it looks like our possibilities for hamster would be probably sterling or sternum. Um, what does it give me for ling? Just because I like longer, I prefer longer words over shorter words. Uh, lingerie. Uh. Lingerie could be possible if I do Erie Canal after that. Um, canal, that would require me breaking into Can and Al, but that's possible. Uh, linguist doesn't give me good letters. And if we had Sternum, then we'd have things like Number. Number, Numerous. I mean, Burr is a possible beginning. Number one, number two. So is number three of, hmm. Number three is nice because we have birth and then R-E-E, -E, which could be something sim different. I'm trying to think if number three is, refers to anything in particular. So let me look up. Just in plain old Google, what I get for number three. Okay, I get the, the number three, but that's different from the phrase number three. Uh, maybe what if I go to Wikipedia? Oh, it has a disambiguation page for number three. Okay, right, they're the Cylons from Battlestar Galactica, but I don't know of a good way to clue a particular Cylon. Uh, a single by my chemical chemical romance okay I'm I'm not too thrilled with number three um, but number two might work and we have Bert instead of birth um, oops want, want to go here but you know I, I had lingerie and Erie canal before and I'm gonna go with that so I uh, Missed out on putting in hamster here. And I'm going to go lingerie, Erie Canal, hamster, sterling, lingerie, Erie Canal. Let's see. Hamster is in orange, lingerie is in yellow. in blue and I don't want to have um, something that starts with canal that's just another kind of canal like canal zone but uh, I mean there is if I wanted to go multilingual I could go for something like Canal Plu which is I believe a French television station oh but it's spelled with a plus sign so that doesn't even work um, just let me briefly see if there's anything that starts with canal that isn't actually a canal. This time I'm going to New Traumatic because I'm more interested in dictionaries. Uh, dictionary search. Canaletto, not a thing I'm familiar with. Uh, no, these are pretty much variations on canal. So I will break canal into can and al. Can in orange and I, I 
I'm okay with having one or two three-letter words as long as they're entirely contained with other, with other, within other entries. So the Erie Canal ca can link is fine. Ow. And I see that we're getting close to uh, the wanting to end things. Um, soon I will go into go over uh, 75, go in, go over 78 and we'll see the little warning highlight go up for the number, letter count. So AL, I don't want to make this too long. Uh, let's see, I have 11 letters to go. Um, so let me just see. Uh, let's see, we could do Alice and something starting with ice. You can do, uh, there's a lot of things for AL. Um, I might actually see if I can make these meet up. Um, I was going to wait until I was uh, at 78 or higher, but this is close enough. Uh, so what's going to happen is we need we have 75 letters down. We want 86. We need 11 letters in between. Uh, so let me count that out from... Um, all right, that's 20. So I think this is 11 letters here. So we would want these 11 letters to have to be filled in. And because I've been keeping track of where each word ends and begins in each of the two times around, I know that I want to have um, the first time around, it's going to start with AL, then have a few letters. It's probably not going to be a 13-letter word. We could try searching for one, but I'm not too confident. But maybe it's, you know, um, four or five letters here, and then another. So I think what might happen is that we break this up into three chunks. Um, a chunk, um, and so AL and the first chunk makes a word. The second two chunks make a word, and then delivers. Coming from Erie Canal, we have the first two chunks making a word, and the third chunk making a word with DE. Um, and this is really where COT comes in useful, because um, it can do this all of this um, very nicely. So I have three different unknown strings of varying lengths. Um, we could go through and say, well, what if the first one is three letters, the second one is four letters, the third one is four letters, and so on. That's very tedious. Fortunately, COT has a built-in feature that will eliminate the having to try all of those possibilities for us. This time, I'm going to say ABC in vertical lines is 11. That means that the total length of A, B, and C put together is 11 letters. Uh, next up, we have... Uh, let's see, I said that I wanted AL and the first string to make a word. I wanted the second and third strings to make a word. I wanted the first two strings to make a word by themselves, and the third string to make a word with DE. And um, I'm going to add in another cons uh, some individual constraints just to make sure I don't have any three-letter words in here. I'm just going to say A is at least two. That's two uh, to any higher number, B is at least 2, C is at least 2. And it will return the words that match these four uh, string constraints. Um, we'll see how long it takes. Probably longer because I've got four. Oh, that was faster than I thought. So some of them we see like... Um, Alas, certainty, ascertain, tied. They have certainty and ascertain are variations on the same word, so I wouldn't want to use those. Uh, let me just... Um, sometimes when there are a lot of, of these of results returned, um, you will find that, say, the, the right-hand column will have everything that has tied in it, and you can say, well... I don't like tied as a word, so I will skip those and go on to the next one. Um, but this seems to have few enough results that they're kind of scattered, so I need to 
uh, go through and just see what makes words in everything that I like. Um, although, Thoughton? No. Alfinet. Um, key, I saw the Eternal Horde. Altruist, Ichor, Truistic Horde is a possibility. I'm not sure if altruism and truism are related. Uh, that would be here. I'll hold the, onto that for now. Look throughout here. Uh, can see now. Actually, I like this one better. All in, uh, the poker term, in sconce, linens, and concede. I'll just keep on going to see if there's anything else I like better. Nope. Um, so I will throw that in. All in, linens, in sconce, and concede. That takes me to 86 letters, which is exactly what I wanted. And you'll see that the letter count has lit, has highlighted itself to remind me that I am close to, or in this case, at the end. All in. Linens. Uh, linens is going to be in purple. In sconce in orange and concede. Oh, let's put it back in blue. Now it used to be when I was doing these in graph on graph paper, I would just have one string of letters and I wouldn't keep track of I would just put in all of the word boundaries. And so I would have to go through and and figure out which of the word boundaries, you know, how many word boundaries each entry went through and count through and see if the ends lined up. Having done it in uh, with these two extra rows, keeping track of the words that go in the first time, the words that go in the second time, all I have to do is make sure that the um, words in the first row, uh, whatever is left over that, get, hooks up with the second row in the, in the right way. Um, so in this case, it's saying, well, if we bit in this case, um, you know, we can trace the first the first uh, time through the through the grid. If we say we started at Rihanna, Rihanna, Bar, Racing, Letterman, Tech, Ambergris, Hamster, Lingerie, Canal, or Can, All In, Ensconce, Delivers. Um, then we go around to the second time. Potpourri, Hanna Barbera, Singlet. Term, Antechamber, Grisham, Sterling, Erie Canal, Linens, Concede, Liver Spot, Poor. And we come back around to Rihanna. Now, if we had, um, if you're not keeping track of which is the first go round and which is the second go round, you have about a 50% chance of, at this time, realizing that, oh, I accidentally made two loops. And what you need to do is find a, a section of your grid which is not terribly constrained um, and say and it probably about uh, probably needs to be around 10 letters or so to give you enough freedom to change it and say all right I need to change this around so you might um, look at say singlet letterman antechamber and say okay I need to make I'm going to start with I'm going to keep singlet or something like it and then I'm going to, instead of having term be a word that's contained in Letterman, if I did, you know, just letter and then something that extended ter and eventually used the same number of letters with the same number of word breaks but didn't have the same containment, um, you sort of switch the parity. It's, it's hard to explain um, using words, and I might have been better off accidentally coming up with two loops and showing how to fix them. Um, but it's not the worst thing in the world to have two loops. I've I've written puzzles where there were two loops, and I just numbered one loop and gave the other loop letters, and it's not quite the same as a snake charmer, but it's the same principle, really.
Um, so we have a grid. Great. I am now going to go and take this grid and finish it off. So here is Inkscape. As I said, it is a vector graphics program. I have opened a blank Snake Charmer grid template. And I am going to first put in the letters that I've written uh, for this. So I might have to refer back to my spreadsheet, but um, so I'm going to put them, say, here. Um, so I'm going to start with Rihanna, and I'm putting one letter per square. It's a little tedious, but um, you either get used to it or you make little templates that will allow you to uh, speed up the process, and I should really do the latter at some point. But no matter, I will do it by hand for now. So I am putting just one letter in each square. I may adjust it to look nicer if I decide that it's not really aligned the way I want it to be. Rihanna, Hanna-Barbera. Oh, before I get any further, I'm going to do what I should have done at the start. Um, I'm going to take this blank grid and I'm going to add some layers. So first layer is the answers above current. And I'm going to take all of the letters that I put in and put them into the answers layer. Uh, that means that I can easily remove, uh, hide the letters if I want to show a blank grid. Layer, move selection to layer above. Now they're in the answers layer. I will also put a grid number layer above that layer, which I will uh, use when I want to put the numbers in. Alright, so now the Alright, this might get a little bit dull, but it won't take too long. Hanna-Barbera Racing. Uh, let's move that around. It's a little bit squished. Yeah, some of these I adjust by hand in order to make sure they're not uh, squishing up against the grid lines. Singlet. Uh, whoops. Managed to select something that I shouldn't have. Singlet. Letterman. Turn. Let's see what was next. Antechamber. Ambergris. Grisham. What was my ham again? Hamster. Sometimes I do the uh, fill it, finding the letters to make to fill up the puzzle and then put it aside for a while and pick it up again and, and do this step. And at that point, I find myself going, oh, I don't remember what the words were. I have to go back and forth a lot. So it's, it does save some time to do it uh, right away. Sterling. Uh, lingerie. The Erie Canal. All in. I'm now realizing that I have two different 
entries that begin with L-I-N, but one of them was the overlap of L-I-N-G in Sterling and one with the overlap of L-I-N in All In. They're pretty uh, la lingerie and linen, you know, they're both things made out of fabric, but they're sufficiently different that I'm not bothered by that. Linens and sconce. Uh, what was it? Delivers, liver spot, po and potpourri. So we're coming in on. The end and I see that I have not made it hopefully I've not made any mistakes because it meets up again potpourri and Rihanna and now that I've put in the answer letters I'm going to now go to the grid numbers layer and put the numbers in um, I'm going to start up at with number one and I'm gonna I'll remember to change the change a few of the things. I need to align left now because I like to left align my numbers. Um, that is too large a font, so let me change that to roughly 12. 12 looks okay. Um, it's going to get shrunk anyway when I import it into a word processor to make the final puzzle. But one, uh, I'm skipping over I'm, I'm doing these entirely in order, so I'm going to skip Hanna-Barbera because that doesn't come around until the second time we're around. And I don't know how many entries I have yet. Um, so one, two... Uh, okay. I forget that uh, sometimes Inkscape, you have to um, be careful about how you change the settings in order for to remember the changes. But I think that worked. One, two, all right. Barb, erasing. I try to put the, um, the, the numbers in the upper left. Uh, fav if it's not perfectly aligned uh, in a normal fashion, then I go for the upper corner usually. So four will go up here. I can move that around, get it more in the corner. Letterman, five is tech, six is ambergris, seven is hamster, eight is lingerie, nine is can, ten is all in. Uh, 11 is in sconce. Uh, let's see, after in sconce is delivers for 12. <laughs> then we come back around to potpourri is 13. Um... All right, potpourri. Now we now we are in the second time around, so we'll go to Hanna Barbera at fourteen, fifteen, singlet. Term is sixteen. Antechamber is seventeen. Uh, then down here to Grisham. Uh, what was antechamber 17, so 18. Sterling is 19. Erie Canal is 20.
Lindens is 21. Uh, that needs to be new ground. There we go. Uh, concede is 22. Liver spot is 23. And poor is 24. So we have 24 entries in here. And that's, uh, that. I'm, I'm happy with that. When I write a, uh, when I write a snake charmer, I like to have, um, generally I prefer to have fewer entries because fewer entries means longer entries and longer entries hopefully means more interesting letter entries. If I'm doing an 86 letter snake charmer, I like to aim for tw about 24 letters or fewer, or 24 entries or fewer, I'm sorry. Uh, but if you're starting out, if you are new to writing variety crosswords uh, in general, I would suggest that you shoot for about 28 words or fewer in your snake charmer. If you have done other variety puzzles before but are new to snake charmers, then maybe 26 is a reasonable goal. Um, you know, one of the important things is to not, uh, not try to um, be Patrick Berry from the start. Um, I certainly, even after all this time, am not Patrick Berry. All right, so I have 24 entries here. All right, I'm going to save this under a new name, uh, not in templates, puzzle creations. Um, I will probably post this on Patreon later, so I'm going to put it in my Patreon folder, Snake Charmer. Uh, let's see, today is 0513. Snake Charmer, and I will call it the grid. Oh, grid. Um, folder. Save. Um, and if I want to do the blank grid, I can turn off the answers layer, and now I have just the numbers. And if I want to post the solution, I can turn off the numbers and turn on the answers, and there is the answer grid. So um, doing this all at once with layers saves a lot of time later on. Um, I'm not going to get into the process of um, laying this out at this point, but I do want to do a little bit of commentary on what you can do with the clues. Now, uh, sneak charmers are pretty easy, not only to construct, but to solve. Um, in, in making sure I had my setup correct, I, I used this setup to make a diff, another snake charmer a couple days ago. Gave it to my test solver, and she said, this took me six minutes. Most of my puzzles take her at least 20 minutes, so that was, meant that it was really easy. Um, that's not a bad thing, by any means, but if you... Uh, it's one thing to have a puzzle that is easy. It's another thing to have a puzzle that, you know, if, you're, if your solvers are expecting to sink their teeth in and take, you know, 20... 30, 40 minutes on a puzzle and it takes them five minutes, you know, maybe they're feeling a little like they didn't get enough, uh, enough entertainment for their, enough, enough uh, of their time spent. On. And if they're paying for your puzzles, as they do for mine, um, they have a reasonable expectation of this is going to give, uh, give me some amount of entertainment. So, um, some options for presenting a snake charmer in different ways uh, that I didn't go through in the initial presentation, usually you just see the clues listed in order one through, in this case, 24. One thing that I sometimes do to make it a little bit more challenging is to uh, give the number, give the blank grid, as you saw here, give the blank grid with the numbers and for the clues, give maybe two or three of the clues with the numbers. So I might give one, in this case with uh, 24 answers, I might give uh, one, answers one, nine, and 17, every eight, every eight answers. And um, give those with numbers and everything else maybe sorted alphabetically by answer. And you have to figure out what part of the grid it goes to. And there are a couple of ways that you can figure out where it goes. For one thing, if you know the answer's length, you can compare it against the lengths in the grid. And if you have other answers to build off of, you can say, okay, this is going to begin with L-I-N-G. Let me look for that in the list. And now that I say that, it makes me realize that alphabetically might be 
sorting the out answers alphabetically might even be too easy in itself. So, you know, presenting some of the answers out of order is a possibility. Um, still, you want to give them something to, that they can enter in at the start. Otherwise, it's sort of this wishy-washy um, sort of cloud of letters that you have to assemble yourself. And it's a little bit less enjoyable, I think. Um, but anyway, um, what you might do then is take your list of answers and just make a, a word list. Um, if you're going to, to clue them in order, put them in order. If you're going to clue them in alphabetical order, separate out the clues that you're going to separate the, out the entries that you're going to clue specifically in that position and then make the others in whatever order you want. Um, hopefully you have a sense of, of how to write clues. Um, I will probably cover that in a later uh, in a later episode, but for now I will just say that you know for me the the work that has that I didn't necessarily know how to do at the start was filling a grid and then writing the clues to, to match the answers was generally easier. Um, so I am probably going to leave it at that unless there are any questions from uh, any of you. If anyone has any questions about what I've gone over that uh, you'd like to have answered, uh, feel free to post your questions in chat and I will uh, attempt to answer them. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, I also want to say a few things in passing uh, to close. Uh, if you go back to my presentation, I said the last step after you've uh, laid out clues, laid out your solution file, tested and edited, is to publish or submit. Um, if you are a new constructor and you are looking to, if you decide you want to try your hand at a snake charmer or any other kind of puzzle that I do here, and you're saying, well, what can I do with this now that I'm finished? One possibility is to submit it to uh, the magazine that I mentioned editing before, Hatched Magazine. Uh, that uh, we have, we publish on a quarterly basis right now, and we publish puzzles from newer constructors. And part of the uh, intention is that the, the constructors will get feedback from more experienced editors on their puzzles and get the chance to have their, their work um, published and seen by other readers. And, um, you know, we, if you want to subscribe to Hatched, you can go to our Patreon, www.patreon.com slash Hatched. Um, if you want to actually submit, um, I believe the Patreon has links to the submission page, uh, which is on my website, Tortoise Shell Studio. Um, I don't have a good way of linking to it right immediately, but I can put a link to it in the, uh, in the video description once I have archived this. But in general, I would encourage you to submit to things like Hatched or other publications that uh, take guest puzzles. For example, uh, June Pox uh, variety, cr variety um, puzzles that he publishes at Outside the Box. He has a series of guest puzzles um, in various uh, variety crossword types. Um, he normally does Rose Gardens himself, which is a type that I may do on a, on a later episode, but his guest puzzles can be of any other type pretty much. Um, so those are a couple of places where you might go to publish, to see about having your puzzles published, or you can publish them yourself. I published puzzles on my website uh, going back to 2011 or so, um, and started po posting them on Patreon in 2015. Um, but I hope that this encourages you to go out and write your own puzzles, and um, someday maybe I will see you telling people how to write puzzles. Uh, let's see. I have a few questions. Let me see. This is fascinating. I cannot see the right, ex the extreme right edge of your screen, though. Uh, so, I cannot see the extreme right edge of my screen. Okay, I'm. I apparently need to make some changes to my uh, video capture setup. I'm s apologize for that. I thought I had tested that. Uh, so sorry to Derek Allen. Let me uh, check out the other questions. Uh, could I have made any entry in number one? There is no designated star starting spot in a snake tremor grid. It is pretty much a loop. It is customary in an S-shaped loop to put number one somewhere near the upper right because that's sort of uh, 
a natural place to look, or at least in the upper uh, in the upper part of it. Um, as certainly if you're going clockwise. Um, so once you have put in the letters, it it if you have put the letters in the grid as we did, uh, going back to the um, going back to the image. Here's answers. Once we have put in the letters. Um, if we want to put the answer somewhere in the upper right, in the upper corner, then we could have put number one as poor or Rihanna or maybe Hanna Barbera. Um, but you know, at that point, we've sort of set the the uh, general layout. If you want to emphasize a particular ant entry at number one, then go for it. Then you know, say, you know, if you said I really like Hanna Barbera and I want Hanna Barbera to be the first entry then make it number one. Start start with that when you enter them into the grid. Uh, there's no particular reason to, per, to choose one over the other other than your own preferences. Um, let me see if there's any other questions that... Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. What other puzzle types do you hope to cover? Mostly word puzzles? Mostly word puzzles. I um, I think next week I'm going to do a block cryptic, a small block cryptic, to talk about um, both the process of how, of um, what makes laying out a cryptic different from setting a, 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 a different puzzle and the process of setting clues. Um, occasionally, maybe, I'm guessing that in the long run, at least two thirds of what I do will be variety crosswords like the snake charmer or other word puzzles. Um, maybe up to a quarter of the time I will do um, logic puzzles or logic puzzle variants. Um, and the remaining time will be, I don't know, miscellaneous. Um, similar to the distribution of puzzles that I publish on my own uh, website, uh, Taurus Shell Studio at Patreon. Um, in also, as I go along, I'm, um, I'm um, will accept uh, and in fact encourage uh, requests from other uh, from interested constructors. If you want to see me do a particular type, uh, you can comment here or elsewhere that you uh, know to get in touch with me, like my Patreon page, and say, you know, can you do this in a future one? Um, the, there isn't a whole lot that I won't do. Um, I will say I'm not going to do standard American crosswords because I am not that good at them. There are a lot of people who are a lot better at than I am, and there are already uh, comparatively more resources for learning how to do crosswords than there are doing uh, other variety puzzles. Um, for logic puzzles, I'm not going to do Sudoku because it's, again, a, a type that I uh, don't really construct very well. Um, let's see, Derek Allen is asking, is Xquartz Mac or PC? Xquartz is, for Mac, it is the uh, sort of window, it's, it's, it's similar to XWin, I think. Um, it's basically what, I think Inkscape was originally a, a, a Linux or Unix program, and this is what allows it to run on a Mac. I don't know if Inkscape is available for Windows, I should have done that research beforehand. Um, but let me just double check. Let me check on that quickly. Uh, go to Google Chrome and go to Inkscape. Inkscape it is a professional ve vector graphics editor for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. It's free and open source. So you can use Inkscape on Windows as well. Um, let's see, other questions? Um, so yeah, if you want to request particular types, um, you can send comment here or send me a message elsewhere and say, you know, can you do this in the future? And I'm not guaranteed to do it. If it's something that I think I don't know how to do well, I won't, I probably will, um, pass on it, but, uh, I would like to engage with you and, and figure out what other constructors want to see. All right, so if there are any more questions, how about a marching bands? Yes, I will probably do marching bands in the future. Um, I have plans for that. That's one, that's one case where, I, where 
a full-size marching band, which is usually 13 by 13, would take me more than two hours to construct. And so I would probably do a smaller one, maybe 11 by 11. But the principles are still the same. Um, Pathfinder is also on the list. Uh, it's not going to be immediate because over in Hatched, I am writing an article about how to write Pathfinders that will appear in the June edition of Hatched, just as a as a um, preview if you are um, if you have been following along with Hatched. Um, and so I want the article to appear first before I go ahead and do a video um, illustration of how to do it. Um, and I've had some ideas for other for other types that I would do. I, I've there are lots of types that I'm that I have written in. Um, I anticipate doing this about every two week two or three weeks. Um, so my plan is today is the thirteenth. So my plan is to be back here on May twenty sixth or twenty seventh. Um, and I hope to see you then. Uh, any other, any last questions before I sign off? All right. In that case, I am. Uh, thank you for tuning in. If you are tuning in afterwards, I'm sorry I didn't get to field your questions at the time, but um, I will be back here in a couple weeks, and I hope to hope you are too. Thank you for watching, and I will. That's it for today. Bye.